Hello ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to invite you to share some of my experiences in how I have built the Great Northern Lakes Railway. My name is David O'Hearn. The Great Northern Lakes Railway. This railway is located in Lake Macquarie, 100 miles, 150 kilometres north of Sydney in Australia. Lake Macquarie is bounded on the east coast by the Pacific Ocean and on the western side by a large inland lake called obviously Lake Macquarie. My railway is based on New South Wales practice and prototype. I have many industries on the railway including cement works, steel works, oil refineries and granaries. Uh, it is all on New South Wales practice. In this series of videos I will demonstrate the techniques I have used to build the Northern Lakes Railway. In this marvellous hobby there are many ways to do things and I am presenting my way Based on my many years of experience, you may find other ways that work. Fences for layouts. Fences are often said to be the thing that causes good neighbours versus bad neighbours. Fences are often overlooked on a layout, uh, but they really lift at layout's features. They're easy and cheap to make. Fence design is similar the world over, so presentation will suit all models of all prototypes. This presentation will describe how to make cost-effective layout fencing. Firstly, examples of fences. This picture here shows a, a US factory facility with cyclone wire fence around the sides. It also has an activated gate here at the, across the tracks so that the operators have an action task to open and close the gate when they are doing shunting. This facility shows also another type of fencing along the sides of uh, industrial area. There's also fencing not cyclone wire type, but uh, the old post and rail, literally, where pieces of old railroad track have been used to create a fencing. There's suburban fences, such as the ones shown here, down the sides and across the back, which is a timber paling type fence. There's this one, there's a paling fence down the sides, and there is also a two bar ranch or rail type fence across the front. This one, this one has a concrete fence topped by bricks. Uh, slightly harder to model, but still easily done. And down the sides again, the uh, paling fences. And again, more fences here with um, three bar post and rail fence. Uh, types of fences, as you've seen there, there's cyclone wire fencing around industries. There's two, three or four strand barbed wire fences on rural properties. There are split rail timber fences around cattle properties, paling fences around houses, picket front fences, fences made from used rail and brick fences, just to name a few. This presentation focuses on the low cost methods of fencing. Uh, kit bashing of all types of fencing is also available with lots of fence suppliers such as Walther's where you can get kits, but these can add up to very expensive if you're fencing large areas on your railroad. Firstly, barbed wire fences. I use skewers or 4x4 strip wood for posts. I paint and stain first with India ink. I then cut the posts about 4 foot long plus about another 3 to 4 foot to plant them in the ground using a chopper to simplify the effort and to replicate the large numbers of cut posts. The posts are glued with 8 foot centres using PVA glue and then I wrap cotton or easy line around to form 4 rows of fencing and I use weights to keep the cotton or pole, to pole line taut until the glues have dried. I find personally that easy line's a bit too stretchy and if it escapes from you while you're working, it goes everywhere, whereas uh, cotton is much stabler and easier to lay out. Once uh, I've got all the fence strung across, I then align the wires, dr dragging them up or down slightly on each post with a toothpick. Once uh, they're all aligned and parallel, all the wires, I then use a dab of super glue running down the back of the post where it can't be seen to secure the cotton or the easy line. And then if I need to, I paint with rust or railroad tie brown, depending upon the age of the fence, to give the uh, cotton the suitable dark colour. Here's an image of, the pit, of some of the t items used. The, the skewers are shown here and some easy line. As I said before, to do it, I lay the posts out, eight foot centres, planted in the ground and glued in. I then string the string all the way around 
and I use uh, self-locking tweezers or hemostats and other devices to uh, weight the, the strings till I get them all right and level. You can see here I've used some clothes pins to also hold the lines tight and then I uh, glue them in. Here's an image of uh, a rural fence. In this case they've used star picket type intermediate posts between each of the timber posts. This can also be done on the layout using a bit of piano wire. I personally have not done it because the piano wire can be a bit of a risk as you drag your arm across the layout. Here, here is another style part of the fencing where they use strainer posts to uh, take up the, the tension on the uh, ends of the runs of line. And here's another type of strainer post with the uh, sloping 30 degree post. And another type of steel strainer post here. Now moving to cyclone wire fences. As you can see here, what I do is I make up a jig using some scrap timber. I allow 10 foot spaces between the verticals, six foot distance on verticals between the top and the bottom rails, plus another two foot for the barbed wire on top, if, I've if I'm using barbed wire on top, and two to three feet on the bottom to allow planting of the completed fence into the terrain or layout. And I make the rails on the fence with uh, 28 hour brass wire, but this is for HO scale, and I solder the brass wire pieces together. This image shows my timber jig where I've marked out this, the fencing and the brass wire supplies. I uh, tape down the brass wire with just some painter's tape or masking tape, then solder each of the junction points where the wires are using some flux and uh, a reasonable quality solder. Once that's completed, I can lift it off the jig, the fence. I can then plant the fence into the terrain or onto a vertical part of the jig, just so that it's held vertically. Then I cut tulle to, to use as the mesh. Now to, to cut tulle is a bit of a trick, so I'll explain that in the next slide. And then once the tulle is cut out to the right size, the ten, in other words, 10 foot by the length of the fence, um, I attach it to the brass wire using um, ACC a clamp with a peg or I use ACC and some um, kicker to make it cure quick rapidly. I then bend the tops of the fence posts outwards from the property so that they can hold the barbed wire. Now cutting tulle is a challenge. If you just try and put a ruler over it and run a, a blade across it you'll find it will bunch and curve and you'll end up with a great curved arc. The trick is to lay down a complete layer of masking tape over the tulle onto your cutting board, then cut the tulle, then peel off the masking tape and then you get tulle at exactly the right dimensions. Okay, this again shows the cyclone wire fence with the uh, tulle being stretched across the, the side of the fence and clamped by a clothespin. Making the cyclone wire fence on top for the wire, you can again use easy line or cheap cotton or you can coil cotton, uh, fine copper wire around a screwdriver shaft to make a coiled barbed wire along the top. And I'll show that in the next slide or so. You can then spray paint the fence either gray or old silver, apply weathering with Indian ink washes and weathered power, weathering powders, and apply any vegetation around the base of the fence. Uh, here shows cotton being str strung along and similar to when doing the barbed wire fences uh, the knots originally anchored with super glue and then uh, strung along and adjusted and then anchored at the end and glued. Here's again the weights of uh, self-closing tweezers used on the end just to hold tension on the cotton whilst along the top here the cotton is drying with the super glue. Making um, a coiled barbed wire fence on the top like razor wire you just rotate very fine brass wire or copper wire rather, around the um, shaft of the screwdriver. Many, many, many coils and then you pull it off and just gently tease it out and you end up with this effect. A bit hard to see but along here the wire is coiled along the top of the fence and sat across each of those little two foot extensions and super glued on. Just to show that there are different variations in fencing and you can do whatever you like on your layouts this, this fence shows no bottom or top railing, so they've just used the verticals and strung the, 
the material across the, the uh, sides and put the barbed wire on top. So you could do that on your layouts if you wished to cut out some of the soldering work. This one, the New South Wales Railways, don't put the barbed wire on top. They just have the six foot, six foot high wire fencing running all the way along. So they just cut off smooth at the top. Here's another example of it. Um, and in this case, they've used organza instead of tulle. Organza gives a square cut pattern uh, which looks a bit thicker and denser than the tulle. Tulle gives that hex hexagonal cut. Here is some rail fence that's been uh, just soldered from bits of scrap off cut rail and then heavily weathered with rust uh, and rust powders. Uh, the rail fences, again, quick and easy to make, just off cuts of old rail after you've laid your track. You solder it up using a jig. And why do you use a jig? Because it gets too bloody hot to hold it if you're soldering it. And then you, as I said, paint it a rust colour, plant it and put some uh, weathering powders on it. Uh, here's the jig I made, which is just using some track pins to hold the rail in place for the soldering process, where it's then soldered down. Another type of fence, post and rail, very simple. It's just drive the posts in to your layout and then place the horizontal rails and then uh, paint it. Here's another type of fence, much more difficult, but common in the modern era, where there are vertical pickets um, on a six foot high fence with the spikes at the top. It's a, a, a neato way for modern industries to not look so industrial. So to summarise, there are challenges in building anything, but there are none really when you get into building a fence. It's quite easy and you can do your dioramas on the workbench to make them much easier to work on, then place them on the layout if you have that opportunity. If you don't, well, do a bit of bending and stretching, but the fences still make the layout great. Some of the tools I've used, the, the chopper is essential for cutting out all those little vertical uh, posts, timber posts and such like. Um, supplies, easy line, uh, I get from the local hobby shop for me, um, cheap cotton I get from Spotlight, which is a haberdashery chain in Australia, tulle and organza again from Spotlight, the haberdashery suppliers, skewers from our local grocery supermarkets, which are Coles and Woolworths, and brass wire from, uh, again, another specialised hobby shop. If you don't want to take up the challenge of building your own fences, you always have the fallback of going to commercially available fencing types and this shows one from Central Valley. They make quite a range of different types of fencing, which can all be used to build, build great fences on your layout. Thank you very much for your time. In this talk, I will talk about crush connectors and front wiring for your layout. Now, this clinic is about making wiring easier as we get older, so that it's easy to install and easy to fault find. For those who, for you who like to hang upside down under their layout, hot soldering iron in hand and exposed skin ready to catch the molten drops of solder as they fall from the deck. Uh, you may leave the clinic now because you're clearly masochists. But the rest of us that want to make our life simple by having easy to work on wiring, please stay and I'll explain how it's used on my layout, the Northern Lakes Railway. Now the aim of this is to, uh, clinic is to show you how to make wiring of your layouts easier and to ensure non-soldered connections are secure and tight. That doesn't mean that um, I'm anti-solder. Solder has its place, but there are times where solder is no good. If you're using a bunch of wires going into a terminal block, soldering the tips of them before you put them in the terminal block, the, t the solder over time will cold flow under the pressure of the clamp or screw and it'll gradually become loose. So you'll find even the American standards for crush connectors insist that you don't use soldered wire tips. You simply twist and clamp the wire. These photographs show you what wiring is like under many people's layouts. These photos actually came from the Newcastle Model Railway Club and are presented here with their kind permission. But they show the rat's nest of wiring that evolves over time and particularly worse in club environments where every man and his dog has a go at trying to fix the wiring. 
It looks like a spaghetti bowl. It feels like an archaeological dig as you try to chase down faults and problems with the wiring. And it just causes total chaos. This wiring is now being replaced by front layout wiring. And here's an example of it, where a piece of one before radiator pine timber is mounted across the front between the legs and the cable runs for the buses are laid parallel on the timber clamped with cable clamps. You will see there on the left hand side there's a black wire tied in a knot. That's not a permanent fixture, that's simply there for a bit of troubleshooting at the moment and once the problems are resolved that'll be gone. But it makes the wiring much neater, it makes it much easier to troubleshoot. To make the cable runs nice and neat uh, you could use either cable clamps as you saw but they're difficult to apply sometimes because you've got to try and hold the clamp in one hand, hammer in the other and then hold the timber straight. The method I much prefer is using stapler. These cable tacker type staplers are readily available from places like JCAR and some hardware stores and uh, are relatively cheap to use. Another tool that I find very very useful is a wire stripper. Now there are lots of wire strippers on the market ranging from very cheap tin plate ones which tend to give you blood blisters and pinch your hands through to these ones which are much better, much more sophisticated. They cost a bit more but they save you tons of effort in the end of the day and tons of pain. Now how do you accommodate accessories and electronic circuit boards that need to go under your layout? In this layout you can see they've placed a piece of timber hanging down from the bottom of the layout with all the pieces of circuitry on them and then that goes down to the bus. On my personal layout I have them mounted on a piece of timber which is hinged and when not needed for troubleshooting that they hinge up to the horizontal under the baseboard so they can't be seen and held there with a barrel bolt at one end and of course hinges on the other but when I need to work on them I just slide the barrel bolt the panel drops down and it's readily able to be worked upon and as you can see it's quite clear how to troubleshoot all that. The other key thing is colour coding of your wiring. That is essential. I know of some people that try to skimp and save by using odd pieces of wiring all around the place and end up with all sorts of different colours on the one section of cable run. Don't do that, it's false economy. When you consider the cost of wiring and the life of the layout it, it's very cheap to go buy proper rolls of cable and then you have them and use them for your life of your layout and the total cost of all the cables probably still less than the cost of one locomotive. This is Steve McGee's layout. He mounts his circuitry and cables and everything towards the front and he has a front fascia which is on a 45 degree slope. He can unscrew the front fascia, flip it 180 degrees down and re-screw it and then he has everything readily available to be able to be worked on while sitting in a chair at the front of the layout. Much more comfortable way to work. On my layout I use electrical conduit, 2 inch electrical conduit running along the front with the bus wires sitting in that. I bring the droppers from the track through holes in that back of the conduit then join them to the bus cable. I use the wire stripper to pull apart the insulation, wrap all the wires around the gap where the insulation is, then put a blob of solder on it to secure it all. And I make sure that the, obviously the polarity of the two droppers are se separate so they can't short circuit to each other. And as you can see there I've used colour coding, I've got orange wire for droppers and blue wire. Blue wires go to the blue bus, the orange wires go to the orange bus. On the right hand picture there, inside of a control panel, and I have five control panels, each control panel has uh, two terminal blocks, one for 18 volts AC and one for 12 volts DC. I also have light hubs from Woodland Scenics which I use to control the lighting on the layout so that I can vary the intensity of the lighting to make sure it suits the purpose for the day. To make the connections into screw blocks we use ferrule bootlace connectors or insulated ferrules, there's many names for them. It's very simple to use them, you simply strip the wire, uh, twist it, push it through the connector, crimp the connector, trim off the excess that's poking out the end, front end of it, 
and adjust the, the length of metal that's needed to go into your terminal block, then screw it into the terminal block. The beauty of these is they give a good, firm, secure connection. Unlike a, a tinned wire, which will come loose due to cold flow of the soldering, these won't. They also contain all the wires, so you don't have any stray little strands of wire which can find their way across to another point in the terminal block and cause a short circuit, which is very hard to find. So I'm a great fan of these insulated ferrules or bootlace ferrules or whatever you want to call them. Now I buy mine for sizes 0.5 upwards of a millimetre upwards from a place called Rhino Tools in Australia. For the ones below 0.5 I use another company called Carol's and there's an example of their little box there. They provide all the smaller ones. Now there are two standards in international standards in the colouring of bootlace ferrules. There's a French standard and a German standard. So because we sell both in Australia, you have to uh, go and purchase by size, not by the colour code. Otherwise you might end up with the wrong uh, bootlace ferrules. This shows uh, the use of the bootlace ferrules. There's two NCE switch it panels and they run to a terminal block and then the cables run from the other end of the terminal block. It makes the wiring much neater, it makes troubleshooting much simpler, it makes changing out of cables or pulling them out, change, swapping them over much simpler. It has lots of things to, to go for it. I'll now give you a demonstration of how these bootlace ferrules uh, are applied. For this demonstration, I will show you how I am going to put some staples in here to allow run of the conduit. I'm going to run some black and red wire up to terminate in this terminal block, which is a plug unit to then plug onto another unit. So just to show you very simply, staples, there's not much to it. This is the staple gun the staples themselves are called cable staples. Simply place the staple gun and and staple away to, to provide the support for the cables. Then I take the black and the red wire that I'm choosing to use. I run them through the the cable stays, which is going to be my bus run. I then strip the wires using my stripper. I twist the wires. Notice I have stripped quite a distance of wire. Now for that particular gauge of wire, I'll be using the 0.34 millimeter ferrules. There are the examples on the table. So I pick one up, I feed the twisted wire through it. and twist the ferrule down onto the cable so that it's nice and snug with the insulation of the cable under the plastic part. Um, you'll notice that part of the strip wire extends out the end of the ferrule. That's quite okay. I then take the crimper, insert it in and crimp then trim with a pair of side cutters to get rid of the wire that's hanging out the end and to shorten it slightly so that it will fit into side of the terminal block. Then have it crimped like so. In 
insert it in the terminal block. And it's done. Similarly for the other wire, the red wire, take the other ferrule, insert the wire through it. Pulling it down again, the insulation down over the or the ferrule part down over the insulation, the plastic part of the ferrule. Crimp it, trim it to the appropriate length, and then insert it in the terminal block. Then give them a tug just to make sure they're secure. And that's it, simple as. And it makes all your wiring nice and neat at the end of the day. And then concluding the demonstration, I just want to summarise by saying that what we've presented here is only one method of wiring a layout. Everyone has their own levels and systems and ways of doing things. But the front wiring system joined by bootlace connectors does make life easy and dare I say it, enjoyable when you're doing your wiring. I don't advocate totally stripping out and redoing your wiring if you have an established layout, but if you're about to do new work on your layout or, or add extra wiring, think about going towards front wiring and using bootlace connectors wherever you have terminal blocks. And just to summarise some of the referencing material, the crimpers, the feral kits, I get from Rhino Tools, as I said, and their website's there. Small size insulated ferrules, the 25mm and 0.35mm, come from Carol's, and the staple gun comes from JCAR. And there's some rough idea of pricing of the JCAR items in Australian dollars. Thank you. Hello, this clinic is about making roads. There is many, many ways to make roads, and they're all good, valid ways. A quick YouTube search or Google search will quickly provide you many of those methods. This presentation will show you the pros and cons, in my opinion, of these techniques, and the method that I use and prefer best in doing my roads. First method that's commonly used is the plaster approach. This consists of placing some form of formwork be it either styrene or uh, balsa timber edging, then using a plaster or product like Woodland Scenic Smooth It, mix it up and pour it in between the formwork and then trowel it out relatively smooth. This is straightforward and easy to understand process. However, you need to sand the surface when you're finished, when the plaster is dry. That creates a lot of fine dust, which becomes very difficult to keep clean on, get rid of in the layout. You have the hard raised edges where you've removed the formwork that need to be either smoothed over or you need to build it up with a kerb or something. And you risk spilling wet plaster on scenery and track work unless you've got everything well masked off. The next common approach is the sandpaper approach where you simply cut and glue the appropriate grade of sandpaper, stick it down and that forms the road. You then paint it. Uh, again, an easy to apply, easy to understand technique. The disadvantage is if you brush against sandpaper, you leave a skin trail. Just try it. And it becomes very hard to remove those marks on the sandpaper. Also, the road becomes very flat. There's no contour in it. There's no camber in it. And it's difficult to apply and carve potholes, cracks, and all the other detritus that ends up on our roads. Next method is using tile grout. It's similar to the plaster approach, but you don't necessarily use formwork because it's thick enough to stand by itself. And the tile grout provides a texture. So it gives um, some sort of a three-dimensional approach to the road material. Its advantages, it's quick and easy to apply. And as I say, it provides a good texture. And it's also very good for creating dirt roads using a brown tile grout. The brown tile grout representing the dirt very easily. The disadvantage, again, it needs sanding and levelling, unless you're very, very good at applying the tile grout. 
Another approach commonly used is to either use plastic, card or paper. You cut, you cut the paper or plastic, styrene, whatever, to the shape that you need for the road. Uh, you paint it and you glue it down. Again, an easy to understand approach. Disadvantages, it's difficult to get compound shapes over t shaped terrain. If you're sticking it on straight plywood baseboard, easy. But if you're trying to stick it over a bit of terrain that rises and falls and goes around curves, much harder. Uh, again, it's difficult to describe repairs and cracks in the roadway and it has limited texture. It tends to be too much of a flat earth. And although we think our roads are flat, they're not. My approach is to use a product called EVA. EVA is a recycled rubber product. It's a foam rubber in a sheet. It cuts easily with the scissors or knife. The product was originally made for underneath play gyms as a soft protective surface. It's also used for gym mats and used for various other applications where you want a bit of cushioning. Uh, often used in factory environments as a cushion on the concrete floors under where people stand. It's very cheap. You can buy it on eBay for about a dollar a sheet. And it comes in multiple colours and multiple thicknesses. For the roads here I use a 2mm thick sheet, uh, but I also use a 10mm sheet when I'm creating rock walls and things like that because again it fits easily, it's easy to cut, easy to shape. What I do is I cut the sheet of EVA for the road surface, I then cut a narrower sheet to go in the centre of the road, sticking the, the, the narrow sheet down first and then the other normal width road sheet over the top. It develops a camber shape for the road, so you get that traditional camber. I glue the EVA down with um, acrylic contact cement, but others use tacky glue or PVA. It, all methods work quite well, uh, so you just glue it down, let it dry. I'll now break to a demonstration of my step one. Step one of building my roadway. In this particular example, I'm building a sloped roadway with a bend in it. So step one, I've got the, the underlying base for the roadway. This is a sheet of EVA. I, I place it on the, the EVA and mark it out with a pencil. Nothing overly complex about that. I now want to build a gutter on the inside of the roadway. It's going to be in O scale and I'm printing the gutters in with a um, 3D printer. This is an example of one piece of the gutter and it will sit like that on the side of the road. Using my scale rule that tells me for HO scale on the side it would be two foot. So I will cut a two foot allowance or perimeter around the inside of this EVA sheet.
how we marked it out. Now the simple task of using a pair of scissors to cut out the form and shape that I want. Or I could have used a uh, sharp knife, a scalpel blade and, oh, and a steel rule would have achieved the same objective. As I've said EVA is incredibly easy to work with. So there's the piece that will go on the roadway. And as I say, curbing will then go on adjacent to it like so. I will now mark out the, the smaller centerpiece which will provide the camber of the road and I'm going to make that the original piece if I measure in HO scale is 17 foot across there so I'm going to make the small camber piece in the middle 6 foot. Again with the scissors simply cut it out. adjustment here. So that's how it'll come together. The center piece for the camber will be stuck like that. Then the other piece will be stuck over the top like that. Then held down with weights till the glue dries. I'll now move to the gluing section. Step one, I'll just put down a couple of sheets of newspaper so I don't get a glue mess everywhere. And as I've said before, I use a quick grip acrylic as shown by the packet. the glue quite liberally as one tends to do and then just troweling it out with a ice poly 
icy pole stick. I'll then place it in its position. Then the main piece that will go like that, I'll put glue on that and lay it out. To weigh the, the, the foam down whilst the glue is drying, I use a series of different weights. Typically, I've recovered old pandrol clips from the railway side of the railway track. I paint them rust-proof paint and then uh, use them as weights in my modelling to help the glue dry. And also uh, railway spikes, old rusted railway spikes. Clean them up and put them on the layout for... Um, holding items down whilst glue is drying. There we go. And that makes step one of the process. Now to, moving to step two. With step two, after the glue has dried, I paint the EVA road material with a suitable grey paint. You apply the paint using a sponge roller or sponge so there's no brush marks to show and the road gets a, a mottled textured look and then you leave the road paint to dry. You can use any acrylic type paints. I've, I am currently using Knox asphalt coloured paint but you could easily mix up suitable grey and white and black to, and with a tinge of brown to, to lay down for your road surface. I'll show you this now in another demonstration, painting the road surface. As I said, I'm using the Knock Asphalt product. Just give it a bit of a shake. Pour some of it out into this whole tray that I have. And using a roller first to demonstrate the roller technique. Not that there's much complex in a roller, but simply roll the paint on. Because I'm going to put curbing, I'm not overly worried about spillage over the sides. If you were worried about that, obviously you'd do something about either masking it or covering it in some way to protect the edges. So the rolling process, just like rolling Regular house paint, nothing tricky. I've also brought along a piece of sponge to also to illustrate that approach. So you can just blob the, the paint on with, with the sponge. And it gives a, a motley effect, which um, a lot of people prefer. Um, because I'm going for the smooth bitumen, 
I'll actually go back to the roller for this particular application. Now we'll set and let that dry well, good and proper, the paint. It doesn't take long to dry, but I want it good and dry for the next stage where we start to do some line markings and things. So that's it for st stage or step two. Step three of my approach, this is applying the road markings. There are many ways again to apply road markings. My method is to use a stencil with a stiff ruler and a product called Stadler Glassochrome Pencil, which is basically what in the old days used to be called a China Graph Pencil. In my long lifetime ago, I used to use China Graph Pencils all the time to update status boards, to record radio frequencies on windshields of aircraft and other various uses. These days, it's, they're a lot rarer to use because everybody uses whiteboards, but they still are available at proper stationers. In Australia, we use a place called Officeworks. I use the stencils and the pencil. I then vacuum or blow away any crumbs left from the pencil so that they don't get caught somewhere else and streak the road. I then use a ballpoint pen, biro, to draw cracks, potholes, and manholes in the surface of the road to give those interesting patterns. I'll now show this in this demonstration. I'm now demonstrating step three of the process. First part is I will mark out where the centre line is by putting some depth, uh, measuring across, picking the centre and putting a small pencil mark just to mark where the roadway centres are. Then I take the, the magic pencils that I like to use, the China Graph type pencils. And I'm using some stencils. So I lay the stencil down the center line. I also, as well as the centre line marking, put down edge markings because modern roads we have uh, the edges delineated so that they can track and seen by cars that have uh, lane diverging technology. Now I'll continue the rest of that process off, off camera because you don't need to see me watch standing there drawing lines. But I will put in a pedestrian crossing markings, which, which so you can see how that stencil's done. Um, I should should also preface and say that in Australia all the road markings these days are white. Prior to the 1970s, we did use some yellow road markings, but they've now all been removed and replaced by white markings. But if you use yellow, and you can use yellow for, for private property like uh, supermarket car parks and such like, uh, the yellow pencils are as available just as easily as the white pencils. So there's the level crossing done. And this road at the end will actually turn right, sorry, turn left. So I'll just put a uh, lane marking on the roadway for that. As you can see, the technology, or the techniques rather, the techniques make with using the stencils and the pencils 
is far, far superior than, than trying to mask it all up and paint it. Once I've done those markings, I just quickly zip out the shop vac and vacuum up any crumbs from the pencil. Then I start making any other road markings, like uh, one can make little cracks. I'm not sure how well that's seen in the camera, but because the unfortunately the road marking is very dark on this particular case, but I will make it lighter later. Just put some random squiggly cracks, and I'll also put a couple of small manholes just using a, a template stencil and just colour it in. I will now complete the rest of this off camera. For the final step I then use pan pastels or dry brush brushed lighter and darker shades of the road colour to show tyre wear and oil droppings on the road. I also apply any curbing or grass dirt edges to the roadway and add vehicles. Now to demonstrate step four in my process of using the EVA roads. I have finished step three as far as laying out the marking on the edges of the road, the center line marking for the curve section of solid marking, so no overtaking on the curve. I've put in the zigzags which are warnings to drivers prior to the pedestrian crossing and as I said there's the pen markings on there. I now move to using some pan pastels to mark out the uh, road tracks on the, for vehicle tracks and wear and tear on the road. Uh, I use some type uh, paintbrush. And the flexible sponge to smudge it all out. After putting on the roadway material like that for where the vehicle tracks are, I'll then put some dirty stains down the middle of the track for where oil spills have occurred on the road. So that's essentially the road. Normally I would then put grass or gravel along the sides to uh, be the shoulder for the road, but in this case, as I've mentioned earlier, I'll be using some 3D printed guttering which will go along the sides like so when it is all printed, but still in the process of printing at the moment. And then of course you put vehicles on the road and uh, the job is done. Back on the methods of road marking, as I said, there are many ways of doing it. A common way is to mask and then spray paint or airbrush the pa paint or dab paint the between the masking tape to uh, show the road markings. Unfortunately, the disadvantage of this is it bleed, the paint bleeds under the markings and it requires lots of masking work to get it right. A second method which is commonly used is to use a paint pen against a ruler or stencil. Paint can still bleed and it's difficult to keep all lines the correct width because as you're pressing the paint pen going along the flow is not consistent and you'll end up with a thin piece of line and a wider piece of line. But commonly used approach, Woodland Scenic sell lots of good paint pens and there are good videos on how to use that. Another method is to use line charting tape or chart lining tape. This is getting hard to get because nobody uses big charts on walls as much as they used to. It's also difficult, depending upon the thickness of the width of the lining tape, to bend it around corners and curves. So you end up with a challenge there. So hence why I fell to the Stadler pencil approach. It keeps the correct size on the lines. It doesn't bleed. 
It's easy to control. Disadvantage, sometimes the pencil breaks up a little bit, but that's okay because that makes it look like slightly worn lines on the road. So it helps with the weathering approach, so to speak. Now for the materials, I talked about EVA foam. EVA, its technical name is ethylene vinyl acetate. Um, and it's a copolymer of ethylene and vinyl acetate, if people know what that means. Basically, it's just a handy little modelling material. Very easy to use, very cheap to get hold of. As I say, the thicker stuff I use for building structures, uh, for rock walls and such like, the thinner stuff for road surfaces, concrete surfaces and so on. The road paint I'm using at the moment is that Knock Asphalt and there's a part number there. The stencils, I'm using Knox Street Starter stencils, but I will be making other stencils of my own for other markings that I need, simply by downloading a picture from the internet, tweaking it a bit and then cutting it out. And um, these are the pencils, which, as I say, I get from the local office supply place. Some examples of well-detailed roads using the EVA. This one shows how they've coloured in different sections, put in shading, used pastels, and jagged the edge a bit where the road surface is near the stop sign. This gives a very realistic and effective road surface. This one, the person has, who did this has done quite a bit of work. They have EVA for the platform surface, they have EVA for the road and also for the car park area. For the car park and road area, they've created the cobblestones by painstakingly marking out the, the cobblestone pattern using ballpoint pens on the foam. They've also used the foam in the vertical, as the front of the car park area as a vertical wall there. Again, it comes up very, very effectively. This one is also used to the foam for the concrete uh, footpath, for the car sales interior and for the roadway. Very simply applied, but very effective. Another thing, advantage of the EVA foam, if you have roads over a railway track, you can use the foam and between the rails, you simply push it down. I use double-sided tape to hold it down so that it won't jump up again, but can still be removed if I need to. And it looks very, very effective much easier than trying to put plaster between the rails and then trying to run your wagons over it and try and clear the track out and so forth. So back to the features of EVA. It's excellent for concrete roads and sidewalks. Uh, best ever again is between the tracks. Just cut and push it down. Even pre-RP25 wheels work well. Marking the EVA as I've said a couple of times, it's as easy as using a ballpoint pen. Just draw your lines, put your squiggles in for cracks, and it comes up quite lovely. Painting, it takes all sorts of different paint. For the road surfaces, you can see the bitumen side, and you can see the concrete side, it's all EVA. And then the road markings are put on top. And just before I go, I'll acknowledge the, the, the wealth of work that's been done by others. In particular, Kathy Malat has an inspirational video on how to make tarmac roads, which uses the EVA technique. It's just that when it comes to the road markings, she uses paint, whereas I go to the pencils.